true crime fandom, like many things in life, comes in flavors. Maybe you want the stories where the bad guy gets his just desserts. Maybe you love the mystery of a cold case or the fierce joy of a survivor story. Maybe you think Ted Bundy was a hot piece and you lie awake at night worrying about what that says about you. Me? I love the weird cases, the whack jobs, the stupid would-be serial killers, and the cult leaders. But some crime cases are hard to put a light spin on, because no matter where you look, it's nothing but darkness. On June 12, 1977, a Girl Scout camp outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma welcomed its annual return of counselors and young girls. Camp Scott welcomed 140 girls in all, some of whom who had attended for years, but for others, it was their first time. 27 of these campers were assigned to a site called Kiowa Camp. Within Kiowa Camp, Tent 8 was farthest from the camp counselors and partially obscured by the outdoor showers. In this tent was Lori Lee Farmer, Michelle Heather Goose, and Denise Milner. Lori was a bold girl who desperately wanted to try sleepaway camp, though she didn't care where she went. Instead, it was Lori's mother who chose this particular week at this particular camp. At eight years old, Lori was the youngest girl at Camp Scott. Michelle Goose was a lover of plants even at the age of nine. Before she left for the week, Michelle gave her mom strict instructions on how to look after her African violets. Denise Milner had never spent the night away from home before. She had gotten scared the night before and had told her mom that she wanted to stay home. Her mom made a deal. Denise would try just the first night and see how she liked it. Denise's very first night away from home would become her last. That first night at camp was rainy, so instead of sitting around a campfire, the girls were in their tent early. All of them wrote letters home. Michelle and Lori said they were having fun so far. Denise begged to be taken home. Then it was lights out. A few odd things happened during the night. One of the counselors at Kamash Camp, a little distance away, saw a dim light out in the woods. When she pointed her own flashlight out into the trees, the dim light disappeared. When she turned her flashlight off, the light eventually reappeared and moved off to the northwest, toward Kiowa. Around 3 a.m., a counselor at Kiowa woke up and heard a strange, guttural grunting noise. She stepped out of her tent and turned on her flashlight, and the grunting stopped. She walked around the tents but didn't see anything, so she went back to sleep, but not before hearing the noises again. At an unknown point in the night, the girls of Tent 6 saw someone with a flashlight approach their tent before moving away. It was later confirmed that this was not any of the counselors. There is also a report that one of the girls at the camp heard a scream in the middle of the night. If that's true, it must have come from Tent 8. At 6 the next morning, camp counselor Carla Willihit was walking towards the showers. When she saw a sleeping bag on a trail, she thought perhaps something small might be wrapped up inside. She was right. Inside the sleeping bag was the bloody body of Denise Milner. Immediately, Carla ran to notify the camp owners and call the police. When the camp's adults gathered around Denise's body, it took a while for it to dawn on them that there had been two other girls in Tent 8. They started a search, and the worst scenario turned out to be true. Several yards away, two more sleeping bags were found, each holding another little girl. The first responders later said that the sleeping bags were so small and the girls curled up so tightly inside that when they saw the sleeping bags, it was hard to believe there could even be bodies inside. While the police worked, the camp staff hurried to get the rest of the children woken up and sent home. The young girls were told that there was a water contamination problem, and while many of them were upset to have their camp experience canceled, all of them were herded onto the bus without seeing the bodies of their friends in Tent 8. Until they got home, the campers had no idea Denise, Michelle, and Lori were gone. The three girls were all declared dead at the scene. The Highway Patrol and State Bureau began to fill Camp Kiowa. It was quickly concluded that someone had entered the tent during the night and attacked the three girls. Michelle and Lori were killed inside the tent while Denise was carried or dragged through the woods before being killed. Tape and rope had been used to bind their hands and Denise had a sewn gag in her mouth. There was clear evidence that the girls had been physically harmed and sexually assaulted. And while we're all true crime fans here, 
I have to admit that this is one case where we really don't want or need to go into the details. The bodies were placed in the sleeping bags and moved about 100 yards away from the tent. Because the sleeping bags were dry, police were able to determine that this must have taken place after 11 p.m. when the rain stopped. At the time, the bodies were found at 6 a.m. Lori and Michelle had been dead long enough for rigor mortis to begin setting in. Denise's body was still warm. After the girls were dead, the perpetrator had gone back to the tent and attempted to clean up the blood. There was a size 9.5 footprint on the floor of the tent. The parents of the three dead girls were called, though they were only told that there had been an accident. A story later surfaced that before calling the parents, the camp owners first made calls to their lawyers and insurance company. Michelle Goose's parents only learned that their daughter's death had been a murder when they turned on their television set. At the scene, investigators didn't have much to go on. Nylon rope, duct tape, a red flashlight, and a crowbar were found close to the bodies. One other clue surfaced, but nobody knew what to make of it. Some of the camp counselors had woken that morning to find their eyeglasses missing. The glasses later resurfaced scattered around the campground. The rope and tape were identified as belonging to a nearby farmer. He insisted that they, along with some other items, had been recently stolen from his farm. The farmer passed a lie detector test with flying colors and the police soon ruled him out as a suspect. An autopsy revealed that the girls had been bludgeoned with a weapon held in a right and a left hand. An ambidextrous killer or two different killers? Two different kinds of knots had been used. One on Denise, who had been pulled into the woods, and one on Michelle and Lori, who had died in their tent. The prime suspect in this case quickly became a man named Gene Hart. As a teenager, Hart had been a local football hero. As an adult, he had been convicted of kidnapping and violently raping two pregnant women before closing their mouths and nose off with duct tape and leaving them to die in the woods. By sheer luck, the women survived to face Hart in trial, where he pled guilty. One of Hart's victims described him making strange, guttural noises when he was attacking her, perhaps similar to the noises the camp counselor had heard in that night. While in the middle of kidnapping his victims, Gene Hart had removed their eyeglasses and tried them on. He had also stuffed their mouths with sewn gags, similar to the one found with Denise. None of these details exactly match the events at Camp Scott, but the similarities are certainly striking. Most striking of all, Gene Hart had recently escaped from prison and was on the run in the area. Tracking dogs soon led police to a cave overlooking Camp Scott. The cave had clearly been used as a hideout before being abandoned. Inside, police found tape, plastic material, women's underwear, a pair of women's glasses, newspaper, and a crumpled picture of a woman. The cave was just 100 feet from the foundation of Gene Hart's childhood home. Writing on the wall of the cave said, the killer was here, bye bye fools. The underwear in the cave was a pair that had been missing from one of the women at camp. So were the glasses. Police placed an ad in newspapers across the country looking for the woman in the crumpled photograph, hoping that by identifying the woman, they could find her connection to the killer. They soon found out that the picture had been taken by a local wedding photographer and had been developed in prison by Jean Leroy Hart. Hart remained on the run for months, but was finally caught hiding out in a friend's cabin. When he was arrested and brought in for questioning, he was wearing women's glasses. Inside the cabin was a mirror and a corn cob pipe that was also connected to Camp Scott. Now, it's easy enough to imagine that all these clues, Hart's previous violent crimes with gags and duct tape, his strange moaning, the disturbing theme of women's glasses, even the fact that he had been on the run and most likely hiding out so close to the camp, add up to a pretty solid case. But there are many people who believe Gene Hart was innocent. Hart was a Cherokee man. He had humiliated the police by escaping jail not once, but twice in his life. And with massive public pressure to solve the case, some believe that it's possible police wanted it to be Hart badly enough to have planted or mishandled evidence. They point to the fact that Hart's previous MO did not run to harming children. They point out the fact that there were sperm found at the scene and Jean had a vasectomy. They also point to the fact that police were single-minded in their pursuit of Hart even before evidence truly connected him to the case at all. 
A jailer testified that he thought he had seen the photo eventually found in the cave in the desk of a sheriff, implying that it may have been used as planted evidence. The corncob pipe and mirror that connected the cabin where Hart was hiding back to Kiowa camp had not been found on the first sweep of the cabin, only later on a second search. The owner of the cabin claimed that the evidence miraculously appeared when the police showed up the second time. The footprint found in the tent was a size 9.5. Jean was a size 11.5. There was a fingerprint found on the flashlight. It was not Jean Hart's. Some believe that the coincidences around Hart's M.O. and a fetish for stealing glasses is proof enough he was involved, but that he could not have been acting alone. The right and left-handed use of a weapon. Two different types of knots and two different locations of the bodies, they would argue indicate two killers working together, one of whom may or may not have been Gene Hart. Two months before Camp Scott had opened, a training session had been interrupted by a ransacking of the counselor's belongings. The thief had left behind a note that rambled about aliens so the counselors didn't take it seriously when it also included the line, we are on a mission to kill three girls in tent one, we. Again, is this evidence of two killers or of one killer trying to be misleading? When Jean Hart was sent to trial, the court was packed. The families of the victims wanted justice. The defenders of Hart wanted a fair trial in what they saw as a corrupt case and the media wanted blood. To the shock of the nation, Gene Hart was found innocent of the murders at Camp Scott. However, he was sent back to prison to serve out the remainder of his original sentence, with added time for his escape. Shortly afterward, he died in prison of a heart attack while working out. Do you believe Gene Leori Hart was involved in the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders? Either way, there's no happy ending here. On the one hand, you might believe that he's guilty. In that case, he was never convicted and the victim's families never got closure. On the other hand, you might believe he's innocent. In that case, the police were so obsessed with their escape artist nemesis that they never searched for the real killer. For me, I could never decide which I believed. All I knew for sure was that three beautiful little girls on their first night at camp died in the worst way imaginable. While the case has never been conclusively solved, two more pieces of information surfaced after Hart's death. First, an autopsy revealed that his vasectomy had never taken properly, so Hart's body did produce sperm and could have been the source of the sperm on the girls' bodies. In 2008, the sperm was sent for DNA analysis, but it was too degraded to test. In 2017, advances in DNA technology allowed the evidence on the girls' bodies to be tested again. Results were inconclusive, but three out of five markers matched Jean Leroy Hart. Statistically, that result would happen with one out of every 7,700 men of Cherokee descent. For some, that tips the scale. For others, it's still not enough to explain what happened on that terrible, dark night in 1977.